Hey everyone, and welcome to the Hamilton Arts Awards. My name is Gavin Stevens, and I'll be the host and MC for this year's festivities. You might have seen me on CTV or the Comedy Network, possibly CBC, but I also host my own podcast called Uncolonized. Some of you might be thinking, Gavin, how come you're going into my ear holes and not in front of my eyeball places? That's because this year's award show is going to be a podcast. For those of you my age and a little bit older, a podcast is a radio play on the internet. Each episode, I'll be interviewing a winner, allowing you to get to know each and every one of these talented people. We had a lot of laughs, got to know the artists, and found out what each one of these talented people planned on doing with their award after the show. I had a great time hanging out with these people, and I hope you do as well. So without further ado, please enjoy the Hamilton Arts Awards podcast. Janet Rogers is a Mohawk Tuscarora writer from the Six Nations territory of the Grand River where she operates the Ojitsto publishing label. Janet works in page poetry, spoken word performance poetry, video poetry, and recorded poetry with music. She is a radio broadcaster, documentary producer, and media and sound artist. Over the past 11 months, Janet has been the Mabel Pugh Taylor Artist in Residence, a joint effort with McMaster University and HPL. The Arts Awards are pleased to have commissioned a series of recordings from Janet that will appear in each episode of our podcast series. Another Vigil Another Vigil for the Fallen Hearts Broken Yet Again Light of Our Candles Lifts the Burn of Loss of Love for the ones who journey on. They leave us in our simple human stew of emotion. We ponder onward into a future without clear course or compass, save that but the light of a candle. I think the thing I've grown used to most during this time of isolation is how you can go outside and no one cares how you look. I'd be lying if I said I didn't enjoy my devil-may-care ensembles. I feel no judgment wearing rubber boots, pajama pants, and a members-only jacket, then asking my wife to hand me my top hat because I have business to attend to. All that being said, I have a podcast called Uncolonize. Each week, my friend Daniel Grant and I talk about social issues, political issues, pop culture issues, and racism in Canada, and we make it funny. I know that's hard to understand, but if you listen to it, you'll get it. Uh, You can listen to it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Anywhere you listen to podcasts, you can get Uncolonized. Creator Arts Award winner Stilo Star is an established visual alchemist. Her artistic process involves both digital and hand cut paper collage, with focus on found vintage media. Her work is a meditation on black culture, life, and fantasy. So, Stilo, can I get you to uh, tell us your name and what discipline you work in? Yeah, uh, Stilo Star, she, her. I am a visual alchemist, so I uh, specialize in cut and paste. I'm a cut and paste enthusiast. <laughs> hmm. How did how did you become a visual alchemist? Uh, it happened through my forays into digital art. Um, I went to school for fine arts and I had a hard time kind of figuring out what my my medium of choice was going to be. I wasn't a strong painter, was not a strong uh, illustrator. Photography was cool, but it was also expensive. And by the time I finished art school, I finished I ended up going to graphic design and kind of figuring things out there through Photoshop and realized, you know, I could bring this all back home to traditional art making practice if I, you know, take it from the computer, which I'm doing cut and paste in Photoshop and just do it with found material. And I've always had uh, an affinity for collecting clippings and never really knowing what I was going to use them for. So, yeah, it kind of came back full circle um, and it just, it clicked. It just makes sense. 
So, so scrapbooking, I guess, would that be the best way you're storing clip, uh, your clippings over the years the, until you figured out what you were doing? Yeah. I would love to think that it was as organized as scrapbooking because okay. I, I, I have profound respect for scrapbookers because there's, uh, there's definitely, um, an organization that's required, but I mean, I would just literally have like manila envelopes that are like dog ear, just filled with random posters or things ripped out of magazines or whole magazines. Um, and then eventually started refining my collection. Like now it's much more organized though. You know, I have clippings that are backgrounds or clippings that are just like people or body parts. Uh, I have animals, plants, or just text. Sometimes I like to play with um, some word found word poetry as well. But yeah, yeah, I would say it's like a much more pedestrian scrapbooking, I guess. You can make a, an excellent ransom note. Is yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I'm fascinated that that's what you you did. What was the drive? Like that's, I'm, I'm just curious to like why you just had the need to cut things out and store it. Uh, there were just images that stuck with me and I've always just been a keeper of things. I, I guess in my family, I'm also kind of like the family archivist. So I just have photos mm -hmm. of family and like uh, little keepsakes, like programs from special events and things like that. Um, so it's just always kind of been a personal affinity that I just like hoard little clippings and pictures. And I've, I used to decorate, you know, coming from the old school, I had notebooks and the notebook cover was like, mm. you gotta customize your notebook cover. So that's, I guess, almost where my collaging kind of started because it was a lot of that. It was including things from like Seventeen Magazine or like Bop or whatever. That I think it was more like Word Up at the time for me. <laughs> but like, you know, whatever hot magazine I was basically clutching in or, or storing in my locker when it was done, I would clip it up and and add it to my notebook. So that's kind of always been that part of me. Like I'm, I'm always drawn to collecting images that kind of just spark something in me. That's fascinating. It's it, it, you were meant to do this, what you're doing. It's like, that's, that's fascinating. It feels like it. Yeah. Um, so uh, I hope you're doing well during COVID. I hope you're mentally taking care of yourself. How you doing? Thank you. Actually, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. I'm doing really, really well. That's good. Um, I'm already kind of a homebody, so it doesn't feel too different. It just feels really prolonged. <laughs> <laughs> I always prioritize rest and sleep and napping. Um, anyone listening to this who knows me will be laughing when I say this because I love to chill. Um, I love it, love it, love it. So I've really been taking advantage of that. Um, and I also am privileged enough to be able to work remotely too. So, you know, it's been, it's been good. Um, creatively, it's strangely been kind of a strain. I do have one project I'm working on right now, mm -hmm. um, but I've been really taking my time with it just because sometimes I just don't feel like it. <laughs> well, I, I, I relate to you 100% with everything you just yeah. said. What do, what do you, uh, what's the project are you working on? If you don't mind me asking. So I'm currently working on a tarot deck um, and it's completely 100% hand cut collage. So I'm not wow. doing any digital collaging for this. Um, I'm working at a bigger size, so they will be shrunken down and, and to scale of an actual usable uh, tarot deck for people to use eventually. There's no date. <laughs> I should probably preface. There's no date. I'm kind of letting the stars guide me with this one because um, it is such uh, an important and powerful tool of divination. So I'm doing studies behind it and, you know, really making sure that the images are going to speak to what the cards truly represent. Um, and they're also featuring Black women as most, if not all, of the human archetypes that are featured in traditional tarot, which in and of itself, um, as someone who sources clippings and, and hoards clippings, is still a very big challenge. Uh, so it's it's been fun though. It's been super rewarding. I'm about 22, 20, yeah, 22 cards in so far out of 78. You talk about in your like bio, because you, you just mentioned it, that finding like images of blackness in history, especially black women, is very hard mm -hmm. in itself. So 
Uh, I, I talked to another artist who you remind me of in your, that your, the, the end result includes the process. Right. That's the vibe I got from your stuff. I, I would say so, because, you know, the reason why I'm creating is because I, you know, I went through art academia without seeing basically any representation that I could kind of relate to in any way, shape or form. Um, and then actively seeking that out and not really having a lot of luck with it until maybe the last five years or so, um, which is, is a blessing, but you know, it was, it was always kind of a struggle. And so that's always been the back kind of running in the background of my creation and my creative processes, you know, representation is always like one of the top priorities. Um, and it's because it is so hard to find <laughs> proper representation in, in print magazines, especially like yeah. we have our own magazines, but I mean, also living in Hamilton, it's not always easy to come by Ebony, Essence, um, Sophisticates, Black Hair Care. Like these are things that back when I was a kid growing up, I would get them from family that was living in Toronto or even living in Buffalo. Um, it was just understood that like, you're not gonna get that here. And sadly, it's almost pretty much the same thing. Um, I do have to kind of travel around to find certain things. And I also prefer to work with vintage pieces. So that's even another, you know, so it's, it's a lot of eBay. <laughs> it's a lot of Etsy and, you know, asking around family, do you know if you have any in your basement? Is there a box that you just like haven't uncovered that just has like a stack of magazines from like, I don't know, 1991, 92, like anything. Um, so yeah, it's, I, you have to get creative in, in sourcing for these things. So it's, it's been a really um, rewarding experience working on specifically the tarot deck so far. That's the story you're also telling in your art, like that colonialism and white supremacy is what you're also putting into your art and showing that it, it again am I wrong on that is um, it I feel like in a in a way maybe but I I feel like I try to just not even ignore it but just create as if mm -hmm. it doesn't exist in the realm in which I'm ex I'm creating um almost as though like you know the beings that are created in these pieces are impervious to any kind of notion of a supremacy of some sort. It, it's just, it's a, I, I don't even want to say an escape, but it is, it's an oasis. I, I try to create worlds and oases where Black people can exist and just exist and not feel, you know, a risk of persecution for anything. It's exhausting. And, and that's kind of where I like to go and rest. Is this what you meant by uh, you talk about spatial and temporal references to reimagine re the black figure as divine or sacred? Is that? Yeah, like I, I'm, I'm taking them out of especially, you know, I use a lot of um, problematic. Uh, what would I call it? Media or material. You know, I work mm -hmm. with National Geographic magazines predominantly. <laughs> Maybe they're a bit better now. I don't really work with new issues now. Um, but, you know, the issues of the 60s and 70s were very anthropological. Like they're going to these places and they're photographing these people probably without consent and not giving them any names and kind of describing their life and their the way they live as something exotic and, and foreign and it just felt really clinical the way that they approached different people who were different, um, people of the diasporas of any diaspora. Uh, and so I feel it's kind of like a partial duty of my work to kind of like rescue them from these, these frames and from these views, from these gazes, and then bringing them into a world that is built out of uh, love and value and appreciation for who they are and, and how they appear and show up to the world. Um, and just kind of giving them like a safe haven away from that, that harmful, clinical, anthropological, colonialist, white supremacist gaze. <laughs> it's heavy. And I want to just kind of shrug that weight off of them. That hence the alchemy, right? Like you're changing history with your, you, with your art, but like a dummy like me that doesn't like just walks into a gallery. How do you express these ideas to your average Joe? I don't. 
I, I allow the work to do what it needs to do for the viewer. You know, discussing a lot of these things and, you know, understanding that a lot of the viewers are not going to be sharing the same diasporic connection that I do. Yeah. Um, I mean, in, in other words, you know, a lot of the viewers that have seen my work are white. So mm -hmm. it's it becomes uh, exhausting to kind of funnel my energy into educating because then it becomes it becomes a teaching moment. Yeah. Um, and I don't necessarily want to be the one in in that position. So I, I allow the work to kind of do what it needs to do for the viewer. If it leads them down that path, that's fantastic. And I'm even impressed myself. <laughs> but I mean, if it, if it doesn't and it kind of brings them to something more fantastical, like they're really just you know, oh, this person reminds me of some kind of space goddess or something, then, you know, that's cool yeah. too, because I've created space for that in my work. And so I, I want people to be able to go there too, if they, if they feel compelled to. The letting go is important. Like the letting go of how people interpret what you're doing is very it important. It took a very long time to get there. It, I wasn't always like that. Um, and, and it's been a recent kind of revelation that, I've always created for myself first and foremost. Um, and what I prefer to share with people who appreciate and value my work is the process. So I love facilitating workshops. I love bringing people into the space of creation that I create for myself that feels inviting and fun and fertile and, and nurturing and welcoming and sharing that and imparting that on people and on viewers of my work. Um, that's where I, I kind of come alive and I'll, I'll talk and converse with people and, and kind of get to the meat and the bones of, of whatever we're working on there. Um, but with my work lately, it's just been kind of like what, it, what works for me and when, it, when I feel that it's done, it's done. And I don't really, I don't overexert myself trying to explain it to other people. And so with the tarot, it's really, it's really great because um, I'm working with traditional framework. So my work already has to resemble something. So people will already get it. The idea is people will already know that, oh, the archetypes are all black women. That's, that's striking. And that's already kind of putting them in the, I guess, on the avenue that, you know, I would like them to kind of consider or think about when they look at my work. But otherwise, everything's kind of already there for them to interpret however they need to. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just looking at my questions here. If you have, uh, if you could have dinner with any artists from any time period, who would it be? <sighs> oh my goodness. Um, you know, I am going to say Basquiat because I would love to have dinner with him in 2021 and just have him kind of look at his career and how it's blossomed posthumously and just just talk i got so many questions about it so many questions about his you know how his work is so beloved and so accessible now i remember at one time when i was in art school um, he was my artist of choice when researching for a paper and not even my professors were aware of who he was until I mentioned Andy Warhol. Oh, really? Yeah. And this, this was almost 15 years ago, maybe. Really? Yeah. Like uh, quite a bit has changed, but I, I would love to speak to him and be like, what, how do you feel about your image and how it's being used and, you know, how your estate's being directed and, how it feels to have your work being auctioned as a black man. And it's just, you know, a lot of, I have a lot of questions that I would love, love, love to ask him. Yeah, uh, what Hamilton restaurant would cater this dinner? Vibes Caribbean and Southern Cuisine. It's a good place. Yeah, good place. big up vibes. <laughs> you gave me a very thoughtful answer on who you would want as your artist and I threw the restaurant at you. I didn't think you saw that coming, did you? <laughs> I did not. <laughs> it's more of a like a relaxing question to wind down, but you took it very seriously. And I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm a very intense person. That's why you have to take naps, right? You got the, so much intensity. You got to exactly. pull it off every once in a while. <laughs> what do you find is the defining characteristic of Hamilton? You know, for all of the political 
chaos that is Hamilton, it is still a very wonderful and soft place to land. It's a really nice pace of a city that you can figure yourself out um, and really build yourself up. It's, it's a real pleasure having been <laughs> born and raised in the city, to be honest. Um, and yeah, I, it's a real honor to kind of be recognized by the city now too. It's, it's real sweet. Uh, Stilo, congratulations on the award. It's well-deserved. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now a word from one of our amazing sponsors. Good evening, everyone. It's David Premi here from DPAI Architecture. With our commitment to community and culture, we're really proud to support the City of Hamilton Arts Awards. We recognize that the arts foster independent thinking, and with the significant challenges that the pandemic has presented, we'll look more to artists to participate in finding creative solutions that will help shape our future and lead our society in the decades to come. I would like to take this opportunity to thank and congratulate all the nominees and the winners of the Creator Award tonight. Thank you very much. And that's episode three, everyone. I hope you enjoy listening to my conversation with Arts Creator Award recipient Stilo Star. I know I did. The music in today's episode was by Paolo Leon Riaz, Tara Lightfoot, Dylan Hudecki, and Aline Felice. Illustrations by Maya McKeague, Michael Byers, and Robin Lightwalker. The City of Hamilton Arts Awards are presented during Arts Week, June 3rd to the 12th. To learn more about Arts Week or the Save the Arts campaign, visit hamiltonartscouncil.ca. Stay tuned for our next episode tomorrow at 7 p.m. Production by Cobalt Connects, Lilt Films, and me, Gavin Stevens. <laughs>